Our next presentation is the uh, results of a co-authored paper from members of the IATMO Green Technical Committee. Rob Zimmerman is currently the Manager of Engineering, Water Conservation, and Sustainability at Kohler Company in Kohler, Wisconsin. In his position at Kohler Company, he is involved in all aspects of, of water conservation and sustainability related to plumbing fixtures and faucets. Some of his responsibilities include working with government regulators and water utilities on water conservation program and co-development, helping professionals in the green building industry understand how to design water efficient buildings, and supporting and growing Kohler's line of water efficient plumbing fixtures. Rob has a, a BS in chemical engineering from Purdue University and an MS in engineering management from the Mil Milwaukee School of Engineering. Rob will be discussing trends, technologies, and barriers to implementation of efficient water use. Rob's presentation is based on a paper he co-authored with Mr. John Keller. Mr. Keller's bio appears in your program. Unfortunately, John could not be here today because he somehow felt that vacationing in the south of, of Germany was more fun than being here at the ETS. So go figure. Rob, please take the podium. Thanks, Bob. Um, and I, I do send uh, John's regards. Uh, he contacted me and said, uh, make sure you say hi to everyone and uh, uh, let them all know that he's having a great time in, in Germany. So um, I'm a little jealous, actually. So um, my name's Rob Zimmerman. And uh, you know, in, in thinking about uh, when we were approached, when John and I were approached about uh, writing a paper about you know, what's new, what's kind of the latest thing that's going on with, with water efficiency, I think we took a little bit different approach on it. We, um, we said, you know, there's a lot of things that have been covered um, and there's a lot of research that's going on right now. What are some of the things that people might want to know about that uh, maybe aren't on their radar yet? but are things that we know are going to affect not only water efficiency efforts, but also uh, water supply and, and more generally the public's perception of what's going on uh, with their tap water. And so we, we took a little bit different approach and, and we have a, a paper that we put together that we really focused on four different things. And so I'm gonna get into those four things a little bit uh, more in my talk today. And, and then at the end talk about how these four things actually interact with each other and could really create some interesting, not only business opportunities for us in the plumbing world, but also some, some real concerns uh, by the general public. So we wanna make sure we're, uh, we've got our eyes open to those things as, as they come at us. And again, I, I'm not gonna go through all the statistics basically about um, uh, water efficiency and the need to conserve water, other than I will say that there's a lot of new uses for water, um, and, and I get, they're not really new uses, but we need to think about water more than just how much water do we use in our homes and on our landscapes. We have to leave a certain amount of water in the environment, not only for the health of the environment, but uh, water is a, a huge source of recreation for us, and uh, keeping those ecosystems healthy uh, has a huge economic impact as well. And, I, and those people who are really looking at this issue holistically are understanding that it's not enough just to conserve water so we can continue to grow our cities. We need to conserve even more in order to conserve our environment. So I know a lot of you have heard John Keller speak before and he always has something interesting to talk about. Um, and I, I just wanted to tell you some things that we're not gonna talk about or we didn't cover in our paper. A lot of these are big issues and definitely important issues, but um, probably have been either covered by some other people at this conference or uh, certainly readily available. And I know you're all disappointed that I won't be talking about how to test toilets. I think that's Bill Gawley's thing anyway, so uh, he's on later today. But there's certainly, uh, what I would recommend that is if there are topics like this that you're interested in, to make sure you visit the Alliance for Water Efficiency website. Uh, they have what they call a resource library and the web uh, addresses on there uh, below and they actually have really good research papers and links to other sites that provide information on a lot of these and, and many other topics. The other thing is that um, you know I, I, I work a lot with end users right so consumers who are buying plumbing products 
and talking about water efficiency. And I, I'm sure a lot of you have the opportunity to do that as well. And as, as ubiquitous as water is in our lives, it's not very well understood by the public. And I think that uh, probably the biggest thing is people don't understand this concept of embedded water or virtual water. Um, the fact that, you know, we talk in the United States that on average we use about 100 gallons per person per day in our homes. And that's obviously calculated a little bit differently than Doug Bennett does it in Las Vegas. But uh, the actual number of water, amount of water that we use is uh, more like 1,300 gallons per person per day when you factor in all of the water that's withdrawn and then all of the population. And so even though that number has declined over the years, uh, the uses for agriculture and cooling that we heard about yesterday in Mary Ann Dickinson's talk uh, constitute a huge amount of water use and we need to get the public to understand that conservation isn't about just about high efficiency plumbing products it's about changing and making new choices in how they use energy and what foods they eat and those kind of things if we're really going to get our hands on this problem uh, we have to look at it more than just uh, changing out toilets as much as we're uh, excited about doing that and then the other thing is that there's a lot of new uses going on uh, of water, particularly in the energy production area. I mean, we're in the midst of a natural gas boom right now in the U.S. and Canada. And a lot of that gas production is, requires water for the hydraulic fracturing or fracking uh, operations. Um, there's a lot of concerns in the environmental community about whether that water withdrawal is sustainable and whether that water is being returned to the environment in a, in a clean state. So again, new uses of water are going to come up and that just makes it all the more important that we make the old ones as efficient as possible. So the first trend that we talked about um, in our paper was about electronics and electronics in the plumbing world. And this, uh, you know, speaking as a product manufacturer, is a, is a huge emphasis, I think, for, for all of major manufacturers, is how do you incorporate electronic technology into the bathroom and the kitchen spaces? And that can be anything from lighting, uh, sensors, music, any number of things that, that are done, uh, including flow controls and monitors to measure water use. And there's all this technology and it's becoming much, much less expensive over time as the capabilities increase and the size decreases and such. So we're able to create a lot of different kind of experiences for people in their bathrooms and in their kitchens. Um, we're also able to incorporate things that make a bathroom a safer place uh, for people who are you know, aging in their homes and, uh, and have their capabilities change over time. But it begs the question, um, when, is it still plumbing, or is it electronics, or is it, you know, if we incorporate something like wireless or um, uh, MP3 or these kind of things into it, is it, is it a telecom device? And uh, more generally, who's going to service this equipment? I mean, if you're a plumber or a plumbing contractor, and you're faced with having to repair um, some of these high-tech products, do you have the capability and expertise to know how to do that? I think that's a real concern. And again, we've seen this. This is not really new to the industry. Uh, touchless everything that these are, you know, standalone devices. Uh, the idea being that uh, people don't want to necessarily go into a public space or even a private space uh, and touch a surface. They're concerned about germs, and we'll get actually into that a little bit later. So these products have always been standalone, but they certainly have the capability to be networked. Uh, a lot of them are self-sustaining in terms of how they're powered, and I know there's a lot of research going on uh, by different manufacturers in different ways of powering either sensor faucets, um, uh, kitchen faucets that turn on and off uh, only when you need them, uh, these kind of things. And th this technology is uh, changing rapidly there's a lot of evolution going on, and I expect to see a lot more changes in this uh, from all the manufacturers in the, in the coming years. But again, it's a, it's a question of who's going to service it, and do they have the expertise to do it? And we're certainly seeing this in the bathroom as well. Uh, these, these kind of features, whether they're, they're uh, showering controls or even bathing controls, uh, offer 
the, the user a whole range of new experiences. Uh, but these controls, once they're in place, could be used for a lot of different things. We could use them, for instance, to um, limit the amount of time a shower is on or be able to pause the showering function while you soap yourself up in order to conserve water. These kind of things are, are already, hardware is already in place to do these things. And so we see this trend towards electronics as being a huge aid in helping people use water, to reduce their discretionary use of water in their homes. And again, once you have all those devices in, places, in place, and if you can then make them uh, smart devices where they can transmit their data up to some sort of local server. This sounds a lot more high-tech than it really is. There's, this is already going on in the, in the appliance industry as well as in the uh, home electronics and uh, electrical management systems in homes. We can do this with water. And the only reason we aren't doing it more widespread, in my opinion, is that water is still too cheap. So that putting in a meter or making a for instance, a showering system uh, send wireless uh, signal to a home energy and monitoring system. People don't do that is because the water's still too cheap. But this, I think, is probably the highest leverage thing that we as an industry can do in the short term is to get people's water use right in front of them, whether it's uh, on their PC, in their home, or on their smartphone, which is probably the more likely way that it's going to happen. So that, uh, I mean, the equipment exists, it's just not widely implemented these days to, to be able to monitor your own home water use via your iPhone. And again, you just take this to the next level, to the community level. Um, this is a, a screenshot from a, a website called H2O Score. And this is actually a, was a student project by some students and their professor at, the, at Marquette University in Milwaukee. And what they're doing is they are approaching water utilities because the billing records are public information for the most part. And they're asking for that data set from the water utilities. They're loading it into their server. And then you as a homeowner, if you're in that service area, can log into this, put in your address, and it will download all that information about your water bills, including how much water you used, and it will score you compared to your neighbors and, and your peers. Oops. Okay. And the idea being here is that we're we're trying to we're trying to make visible people's water use, okay? And almost make a game of it. So you can imagine um, taking, you know, your, your block or your neighborhood doing a challenge of homeowners against each other to see who can be the most water efficient. So uh, it's a neat concept. Um, they are uh, continuing to sign up water utilities in the Midwest to, to be part of this and uh, it's, it's kind of turned into, into its own business for them. So it's kind of a neat project. So the next thing um, is water reuse and uh, I'm not going to go into the, the technical aspects of, of on-site water treatment. There's, there's certainly more qualified people to do that, but I will talk a little bit about how we're looking at this from a, uh, as a product manufacturer. I mean, first of all, there's two really main types of water that's reused that's going to end up in plumbing fixtures. It's the municipally supplied reclaimed wastewater, or as they call it in California, recycled water, or water that's generated from an on-site treatment system. And there's lots of different technologies available for on-site treatment. And it's generally um, from this list, uh, you know, if, and if you have a personal favorite water treatment technology that I didn't put in this table, I apologize, but I tried to cover the main ones that we've seen. Uh, so the, the type of treatment that you're going to use is really going to be uh, dependent on what you're trying to get rid of, what you're trying to, uh, you know, what's your source water in it, what the contaminants are, and then what are you going to do with the finished water? Are you using it for irrigation or for toilet flushing or whatever? So you may do, a, in, in the way the package systems work that are on the market today, they will take a variety of, of these technologies and put them together into a package. Um, they may be custom engineered. 
there's systems, that, you know, a simple cartridge filter is only, you know, 10 or 20 or $30, you know, so they're that cheap. You can buy them at, the, at a retail outlet to highly engineered systems that can go for thousands or tens of thousands of dollars depending on how much water you're treating and how clean it needs to be. So there's a whole range of, of systems here. And so as we talk about reusing water on site, I want people to understand that there's, there is no magic way to do it. It really does depend on your input water quality and, your, um, and what you're trying to get out of the end of it. And then there's a question, of course, about how these systems are maintained because your water isn't always the same coming in. And, and this is actually the generation of, of, of our interest in this as a product manufacturer is that do these systems produce consistent water quality and how do they handle upsets? How do they handle uh, when something gets into the, to the feed water that it's not supposed to be there? So uh, we've actually been doing a lot of work on this um, and there's a lot of things that, that we've learned about uh, these systems that are, are rather interesting. And um, certainly after yesterday's discussion about Legionella, I have even more concerns. Uh, but basically, uh, systems can be very simple from, from basically a filter in a tank with a little chlorination in it to um, a bioreactor type of systems that are meant to treat higher volumes of water to a higher level. And if, uh, we've been doing this study and uh, in fact, there, there will be information about this study presented at the Water Reuse Symposium later this year, as well as at the uh, Water Smart Innovation Show in, in October, uh, where the two engineers from Kohler who are working on this project will be presenting basically our results on this. But even as these systems work according to specifications, they meet the, they produce the water quality that's required by the NSF 350 st standard there's a lot of strange things going on inside of them, and you see the inside here is, uh, uh, like I said, uh, a lot of growth going on, and who knows what all those organisms are. We've also uh, changed, uh, we get asked a lot at Kohler about uh, how do you, what, do, will the warranty on your toilets or on your faucets or your flushometer valves um, apply if we put in a water treatment system on site and what we've said is we've established these limits as far as water quality that we know will work uh, won't degrade the uh, seals and the seats in any of the materials that are in the plumbing fixtures and they're based roughly on the 350 standards and the California recycled water standards um, the question then becomes is how do you know that the water coming out of that system is consistently meeting these, these requirements. And unless you're continually testing or, or monitoring, there's really no way to know that. Even grab samples done periodically um, don't, don't get you the information you need on this. And this is the genesis of, of thinking about this, is that we were, as we were doing this gray water study in a, a, within the, uh, internally, you can see what that water looks like uh, when it gets in the toilet tank. And um, in some cases, the water is, well, in most cases, the water is warm because it comes out of the shower, goes through the treatment system, and then ends up in the toilet tank. And so even though after a, a short time as three weeks, you start to see some buildup of biofilms uh, in, the, uh, in the toilet tanks. And as I said, uh, our engineers will be talking a lot more in detail about what we're seeing here. So this is all a cautionary thing. Uh, regarding gray water or on-site water treatment, make sure that you uh, uh, there aren't any unintended consequences. Okay. So the third thing we talked about was uh, what I consider new threats, and they're not really new because this has been talked about for probably 10 years in the environmental community. EPA's had a program on on emerging chemicals of concern. Uh, you can find it on their website quite easily. But it's new because I think it's going to have a, a huge impact on our industry at some point. Um, and so here's a whole list of acronyms you probably are going to become more familiar with over time. Um, endocrine disruptors, persistent organic pollutants, and pharmaceuticals and personal care products. 
And then the other thing that I've talked to some, uh, uh, some people in the research areas about that are concerned about are nanoparticles. And, and I, I, I was thinking, you know, carbon fiber and those kind of things. And he says, actually, no, the biggest concern about nanoparticles comes from cosmetics. And the, these are particles that are very, very small, but they act almost in a catalytic fashion. They provide uh, a site for um, other toxic or persistent chemicals to bond to that are easily absorbed into um, fish species or into the food web. And so nanoparticles can actually offer a, a vehicle for some of these things to get into our food supply. And we talked yesterday a lot about pathogens as well. So these are things that uh, are out there and in fact are increasing in the environment. So with that kind of to, to get us started, um, I look at this again from a consumer perspective, is that most consumers aren't very savvy when it comes to technical issues, um, but they get scared a lot. And so uh, there's a, a, an organization called the Shelton Group that does market research on consumer behavior and attitudes about sustainability and conservation. And this is one of the questions from their recent uh, Green Living Pulse survey. Uh, how concerned are you about chemicals and products that aren't meant to be eaten but might come in contact with your body in other ways? So this could be anything from uh, personal care products that you'd put on your skin to things that are in the water supply. And, you can, and they, they, brace, they basically segment the U.S. market into four roughly equal quarters, active, seekers, skeptics, and indifference. And so you can see here that of the total population, over 60% are concerned about chemicals in the environment. And so that list that I showed you before, these are all things that people are starting to become aware of through different media uh, reports and such. And you start to see it in, in consumer behavior in areas other than our business, right? So uh, you've heard about BPA and, and the concern about baby bottles. Uh, the whole organic food and local food movement, I think, is related to this. Uh, phthalates and toys and, and the you know, big companies like Walmart have looking, are looking to get those kind of things out of their supply chain, uh, genetically modified foods, um, and, and then of course the whole issue about bottled water and filtered water and all that are, are, are evidence that people are thinking about this stuff. They don't have the technical know-how on it, they're thinking about it. So as these things continue to come up, uh, you know, we're all involved with the water supply. This is going to affect all of us. So how does this all tie together? So you've got lots of things, um, everything from pharmaceuticals, um, you know, hormones, um, personal care products, uh, even things like sunscreen, uh, the, the things that are active in there, get into the water system either intentionally by people flushing old prescription drugs and antibiotics down their toilet or by, you know, just being excreted from the body through the, through the sewer system. These chemicals are highly active in terms of their biological, I mean, it's what they're designed to do, they're pharmaceuticals, right? They end up going through the wastewater treatment plant, they don't get destroyed in the, most of these processes and they end up in the receiving water, okay? Bad for the environment, lots of studies going on right now, a lot of research trying to characterize what's going on with this. But of course that water is the next city's water supply, right? And so it comes back through a water treatment plant. Some of these things can get treated through various means of purifying water. A lot of them can't. So this stuff is coming back to us in our water supply. We have no idea what the, what the effects of this are. But again, a consumer, um, they don't either, but they're gonna assume the worst. And again, as I said, there's a lot of studies going on. Um, the, probably the one that's gotten the most press recently was a study that was done in the, on the Potomac River, obviously a water source. I don't know if this hotel is getting their water out of Potomac River, but Washington, D.C. certainly does on, on the effects of these endo, endocrine disruptors on fish populations in that water. Um, and again, a lot of the water utilities are already trying to keep this stuff out by having uh, collections and take backs for unused prescriptions to discourage people from doing what's shown in that in that picture there, um, and that was certainly help, but it won't solve the problem. So 
what this is going to lead to is a whole concern about uh, from the general public about water supply. We have the safest water in the world here in the U.S., but people continue to buy bottled water. They continue to do things that tell us uh, that they're not they're not entirely convinced. Um, and the reason I have this slide here about the PCR analysis, PCR is, is polymerase chain reaction. So when what's happening in, in this world that's that's changing these chemicals have been out in the environment for a long time. Our ability to analyze for them has gotten much better, and our ability to actually characterize their effects on microorganisms and on the living environment is increasing rapidly. So um, I was told by somebody who works in this business that, um, you remember the Human Genome Project from you know, 10 years ago or something, not even that long ago, where it basically took a year and a half to, to sequence the entire human genome, and it's, we spent billions of dollars doing this, and hundreds of labs were involved. That work can be replicated by one researcher on one piece of equipment in about a week right now. Okay? So we're much more able to identify what's going on at a molecular level with these uh, chemicals of concern in the environment. That's going to change. And I was also told that um, it's likely that this PCR technology can be, it will get much cheaper to the point that a water test kit that you might get at Home Depot or Lowe's today is going to check for hardness and, and pH and those kind of things and maybe some chlorine will actually be able to tell you what species of bacteria are in your water. Um, so, and that, that will be a, a fairly inexpensive test to do. So. Again, I think water purification is going to be a, a, a big deal. So then finally, the fourth thing was uh, life cycle analysis. And I'm not actually going to go into this very much because Len Swatkowski from PMI is going to be talking about this topic later today. Uh, other than this talk about LCA as, as a new form of environmental accounting. So LCA is a way of, of collecting up and measuring and collecting up all of the environmental impacts of a product. Uh, or a service um, over its lifespan and then um, reporting that in some fashion uh, and again as people become much more concerned about the health impacts of chemicals in the environment they're going to want to know products are made safely okay so finally so I've got these four different things we've got control and electronic technology that's just uh, taking over the marketplace um, on-site treatment and some of our concerns about how these systems work and how they're maintained. Um, emerging contaminants and the concern that in the general public there, as well as uh, some sort of environmental accounting through life cycle analysis. So these four different things, they have really nothing to do with each other. But what to look for in the future is how these things converge. The innovations will happen at the convergence of these different things and some of the other uh, topics that I mentioned early on that we're not discussing today. For instance, control technologies have a huge role to play in making on-site treatment systems safe and reliable for the general public. Um, emerging contaminants uh, need to be addressed in on-site control or on-site treatment systems. All of these things uh, and the spaces in between them is where the innovations are going to be happening in the next 10 years. And I got to say, uh, just personally, I've got uh, two kids who are uh, finishing up high school and it's a strange world if you're a teenager these days. Um, I wonder who's going to be able to take care of this kind of equipment and this technology. And um, uh, I've encouraged my son to consider plumbing as a field because I think it's, it's one of these things that uh, uh, all this technology is, is really changing the, the industry quite a bit and will continue to do so. And that's all I have. And if you have any questions, do we have some, some time for questions? Rob, um, Bill Erickson, and I'm speaking as uh, a contractor. Um, you, you talked about the problems with servicing some of this, uh, these products. And um, being in the service business uh, and being a partner with the United Association, we have some of the best training there is. And my understanding of, of this plumbing service business is, is it's not so much a repair business anymore, but it's a parts replacement business. Uh, business. 
Okay. Is Kohler Company and maybe some of the other uh, manufacturers in, in the room, are you going to be able to make available the replacement parts needed to service some of your products? My experience is sometimes we've got to, if, if something goes bad, we have to uh, call the rep or call the supplier. They have to call the factory. The factory has to look at inventory and then they UPS the replacement motherboard or chip or whatever is necessary mm -hmm. to do the replacement, and that is not a good answer to the consumer because they're, you know, without a faucet for right. however long that time takes. Are you guys going to invest in the, in this uh, these replacement parts, uh, electronic the electronic parts, so that we can give the consumer the service they uh, they demand and they need. Well, I won't speak for everyone. I, I know that uh, uh, we certainly do that. Uh, the question, I think there's two questions there. There's a question of, are the parts available? Uh, and that's definitely yes. And can you get them w as fast as you need them? That's probably where the, the uh, room for improvement lies, is being able to get the stuff, have it in the inventory, uh, know what you're going to need. Again, because, because of the proliferation of these, of these devices, you know, it's not like you have one thing that can be used for 10 different products. You, it's almost like a custom thing. So the answer is yes, we have them, and we probably could do a better job of getting them to you quicker. We can take one more question. Um, I'm not sure if you're the right person to answer this, but I was just hoping sometime in the conference that someone would talk about hydraulic fractionation of shale and its effect on groundwater? Yeah, I, I would, uh, uh, I'll, I'll pass on answering that question, other than to say that I, there's a lot of information about it on the web. I don't know how reliable is it, because you have the energy companies saying one thing, you have the environmentalists saying the opposite, um, and I'm sure it's like a lot of industrial processes, is that the impact depends on how it's managed, and um, so, but it's, it's clearly a huge demand, of, a new demand of water. Fortunately, mostly in rural areas these, these days, but then it's gonna, you know, it's gonna draw to the aquifer generally, and uh, it's a big concern. Thank you, Rob. Okay, thank you.